Um, not LL. Not LL. Not the NYD. But um, that eventually led to an article that I wanted to write on on Public Enemy, and I I, I went to go basically interview them at Def Jam's offices, right over there on 298 Elizabeth Street, not far from Five University Place where Rick started. And I remember that day walking in as, as clear as day. I, I um, you know, first of all, I remembered the office from the movie Tougher Than Leather. Uh, it looked, you know, it looked like uh, it looked like the movie. Um, and then Bill took me around and introduced me to a whole bunch of folks. And he turns to me and he says, "This is the new Motown." You sure? Yes, you did. <laughs> you sure you didn't just write that? That sounds good. Did I say that? No, you said that. You right. said that to me. <laughs> Back in, in early 1988, he said it. And listen, that could mean a lot of different things. Um, but what it meant to me at the time, uh, and what it means now, is that Def Jam, in addition to bringing the world some incredible music, in addition to legitimizing hip hop as an art form that could be extended not just song to song, but over the course of whole albums and over the course of whole careers. I mean, everybody kind of knows that about Def Jam, but the hidden significance of Def Jam to me is how it really was a harbinger for um, America's new multicultural era, which is just starting to get its footing. I mean, Obama's election is just the beginning. But if you wanted to know why Obama got elected in 2008, um, I trace a lot of that back to what was going on in that room, in that office at 298 Elizabeth Street in 1988, 20 years earlier. Wow. That day when I first heard It Takes a Nation of Millions to Hold Us Back. That day when I saw uh, Bill Adler and, and, and Eric Sadler and Hank Shockley and Heidi Smith and Lisa Cortez and all these people that populate this book, the people who worked in the office and Faith Newman and Funkenklein, they were black and white and Jewish and Christian and Latino and 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 it was the America I just I really feel like Def Jam helped create the America that we're in right now it presaged it and listen just the other night we were at the New York Public Library and afterwards we adjourned and had a meal together and all these people who I knew previously were in a room together and uh, you know, the way that we relate to each other um, is, is an antidote, I think, in some ways, to 400 years of white supremacy in America. Um, this guy should be the publicist. Right? This is good. I like it. So I'm going to get real heavy on you and then we'll, we'll you know. But uh, all, all that is to say, um, you know, it's more than the music. Uh, it's about what Def Jam did for America, um, and that's really significant to me. I didn't know that day that, you know, a few years later I would actually be um, working just up the street at, at Profile Records. And across the street from here? Across the street from here, 740 Broadway, uh, and working with Run DMC and meeting Russell on a professional level. And I didn't know that two years after that I would actually be working for Rick Rubin as he split from Def Jam and went to form Deaf American, which became American Recordings. And my first, one of my first errands that I did for Rick was I had to go back to 298 Elizabeth Street, which was now vacant except for his apartment at the top. Um, Def Jam had moved to offices on 6-something Broadway. 6 what? 629 Broadway, something like that? 629. It was just north of Bleecker Street. Yeah. And uh, I had to go in and find files, his uh, ex Porn star girlfriend's clothes. Uh, but there was of them. Yeah, I, I, uh, I had to go to his mother's uh, house in Long Island to find some of the original uh, master tapes for the maroon label Def Jam records. So uh, I just didn't know. I didn't know where life would, would take me that day. And, and, and it's really kind of brought me here to this room. And, and even though I was never officially an employee of Def Jam, um, these people are like family to me, and in a way they represent um, one of the best, even though sometimes horribly run, 
one of the best companies that America has ever created, one of the best brands that America has ever created, and one of the best things that America has ever done, Def Jam. That's how I feel. Um, ladies and gentlemen, so here's Say, and do your thing, Say. Um, like these guys, I'm very, very passionate about Def Jam. I'm very passionate about Run DMC. I don't know, you know I would assume the average age in here is like, you know, 22. Okay. Uh, so you guys are all very young. Um, so, you know, I don't know if you guys have any hip hop heroes, but from my point of view, not a lot of music today that's being made is, is worthy of calling somebody a hero. When Run DMC came out in 1983, they changed my life forever. All of a sudden, my music was on the radio. And I didn't even know what my music was. I just knew it wasn't traditional R&B, it wasn't traditional rock and roll, it wasn't traditional soul. It was something brand new. You know, I loved Grandmaster Flash coming up. And you know, we're roughly the same age, but I was like, I might as well have been